Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Jared White, and I'm a program coordinator with the Come to the Table program. Thank you for joining us for this community conversation entitled, What Can Rural Communities and People of Faith Do to Prevent Suicide? This discussion will focus on rural communities and people of faith in responding to mental health crises throughout our communities. We'll hear stories and practical examples of how mental health is being addressed in different contexts throughout North Carolina. This conversation is hosted by Partners in Health and Wholeness, North Carolina Agromedicine Institute, and the Rural Advancement Foundation International USA, or RAFI USA for short. Guiding our conversation this evening will be Jessica Stokes, Associate Director of Partners in Health and Wholeness. Um, if you have any questions during our conversation, please feel free to include them in the chat. Now I will pass it off to Jessica to introduce our panelists, as well as guide our discussion. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Jared, for that warm welcome. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Jessica Stokes, and I work for Partners in Health and Wholeness. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are so grateful to have a panel full of wonderful experts from the mental health field, the faith, faith uh, communities, and agriculture. This is a crucial conversation. As you all know, uh, we are amidst a lot of stresses in this time, a very stressful time, and suicide prevention is something that we can all work on together, rural, urban, across the state, no matter what context we're in. And so tonight we'll be focusing on rural communities and faith communities, and I think that we will all learn together tonight. There's something that all of us can take away to practice suicide prevention. So to get us going, I just want to do a quick round of introductions with our wonderful panel. And so uh, when I call your name, if you don't mind telling us who you are and how your work intersects with mental health. And so to begin, uh, Yvonne, please, will you tell us about yourself? Yes, good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Addison and I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor from Durham, North Carolina. I'm also an ordained minister. Uh, I am the, uh, I serve on the board for the Faith Connections on Mental Illness and also uh, facilitate uh, the uh, task force for uh, suicide prevention and reduction. And I'm glad to be here on tonight. Great, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Lindsay, will you please say hello? Sure, hi, my name is Lindsay Balance Collins. Um, I serve as the pastor of Allensville United Methodist Church and Trinity United Methodist Church outside of Roxboro, North Carolina, um, and I'm glad to be with you, here with you. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Welcome. Uh, Juan, will you say hello to us? Yes, hello. My name is Juan Allen, Latino Outreach Coordinator for Access East Biden. I work as a work with the farm workers community. Great. Thanks, Juan. Yeah. Next, we'll hear from Lamar. Hi, my name is Lamar Graff. I'm the Associate Director of the North Carolina Agromedicine Institute. We're a consortium of ECU, NC State, and NCANT. We do safety and health programs for farmers, forests, and people. I think your voice dropped at the end, Lamar. Just to... I'll take that under advisement. Speak okay. a little louder. <laughs> Okay, and Tiffany, please. Hello, Tiffany. Hi, everyone. I'm Tiffany Hall. I'm a licensed clinical <clears throat> worker. I'm co-chair for the North Carolina chapter of American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, I also work at the Salisbury VA Medical Center in Kernisville. I'm part of their suicide prevention team. Um, I'm, I live and I'm from Winston-Salem. Oh, cool. 
Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for those uh, warm introductions. And before we begin, I just want to say that what we're talking about tonight is a sensitive conversation, talking about suicide and uh, community engagement around suicide prevention can raise up our own difficult experiences. And so please take care of yourself tonight. And um, we have the National Suicide Lifeline um, phone number included. So, so please just take care of yourself. So to begin, let's talk um, with Yvonne. And Yvonne, thank you again for joining us tonight. You bring such a wealth of information. I want to ask you a couple questions. First, to start with this conversation, why is it important for faith communities to address mental health and reduce stigma? Why is that important? It is important uh, for faith communities to be involved because usually faith communities the first contact that people, the individuals and their families uh, who are struggling with uh, traumatic events or have mental health concerns, is their faith leaders that they reach out first, reach out to first before going to a professional person. And so I think this has to do with some of the stigma that's attached to, uh, to mental health uh, concerns. Uh, that's why it's so very important for the faith community, faith leaders and their communities to be knowledgeable about uh, mental illness, about suicide, recognizing the symptoms. And uh, in, in, the, in the Bible, Hosea says in chapter four, the first part of verse six, it says to that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for faith leaders and the communities to be knowledgeable to understand about mental illnesses and what uh, the families go through uh, during that time, as far as caregivers as well. But in the United States, about half of adults, 46.4% 46 .6, will experience a mental illness during their lifetime. And in the United States, only 41% of the people who had a mental disorder in the past year received professional health care or other services. So therefore, the faith community being the first responder have the opportunity to eliminate some of the misunderstanding, the myths about um, mental health. And so that's why it's important to, uh, for faith communities to understand, to acquire that knowledge so that they can respond to those in need appropriately. Also faith communities uh, can position, they're in a better position to facilitate uh, treatment uh, for the individuals. And that is, and I think it's very important for the faith community and the mental health community to come together to collaborate so that they can form partnerships and being able to learn to bring awareness to both, both sides so that uh, these individuals can get the help that they need. And faith communities also can provide a great support for those who are in long-term recovery. So, uh, you know, so it's all about awareness, it's all about education, it's all about knowing and being able to respond. So there are, um, there are twice as many suicides in most rural communities compared to urban communities. And so that's kind of alarming, but this is according to the Rural Health uh, Information Hub. So there are barriers to addressing suicide and mental health treatment. But I also want to, again, to uh, anyone who is in crisis or knows someone who's in crisis, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number is 1-800-273-8255. So some of those barriers uh, that uh, for addressing suicide and mental health treatment in the rural communities, fewer healthcare services, they are limited in the facilities, they're limited. Mental health providers, there, you know, there's, uh, there's a shortage in those areas. And then the transportation and, and infrastructure, we're looking at that, there's limitations that present challenges for people getting to these places. Sometimes they may have to go to another county to receive services. So all of these you know, uh, have an impact on a person being able to get the services that they need. And then there's the financial constraints. So what can a faith community do? What can faith leaders do? First of all, learn about the locations and cost of mental health services in the area. That's one thing. And then build relationships with 
mental health providers is very important in doing that, building those relationships. Identify and build relationships with various support groups like Alcohol Anonymous, Al-Anon, those support groups. And then if you're not credentialed, that's okay. If you need to refer out, don't feel badly about having to refer to a professional. That's, that's okay because we don't want to damage anyone. And then learn what additional resources are available okay, uh, in your community and then use them. Address mental health and mental illnesses in sermons whenever it's appropriate. So that's one thing you can do as well. And this is the uh, Mental Health Awareness Week with, that's ending October 10th. Uh, uh, and so this will be a great time for faith communities and faith leaders to provide some information uh, in, in their ser uh, sermons, if appropriate. Provide a listening ear. Be there for the people. Uh, many issues can be resolved without uh, a person going to professional help, but um, they can get, if they, if you have a listening ear, sometimes it can be resolved, but if not, again, refer to a professional. And then train, recruit those in your congregation, lay persons who have that, um, you know, who have that insight and who have that, that compassion and patience to do that. Train them to reach out to other people uh, to listen as well. And then reaching out and letting know that you're available to help. All of these can help uh, if we're in the community, the faith community, letting people know that you're there, that you're there to help. And learning, and again, I said, and learning and sharing facts, being able to give the correct information, dispelling any myths about mental health, and that will um, you know, help, help to eliminate some of this, uh, the stigma that's attached. Uh, so it's mentalhealth.gov, if you want to go there, mentalhealth.gov gives you a wealth of information as well on what faith communities, communities can do. Uh, be a place, a place of worship that is welcoming and inclusive. Be welcoming and inclusive to, uh, for families and, their, um, and the individuals who are struggling with mental health concerns. Let them know that you do care and that you are there for them. Now, this is pre-COVID, but some of the things you can do to open up the, uh, well, I think I'm going into my next question, <laughs> Jessica. That's okay, you want to keep going, you got it. <laughs> okay, so some of the things that you can do to open up those conversations that faith communities can do, uh, this is pre-COVID, of course, you know, there are health fairs, um, there are churches who sponsor health fairs that can get that information out, okay? And uh, small group activities, support groups for family members, for caregivers, all of these are appropriate. And pastors are in there, they're in a, a, a great role as leadership, you know, to get information out to promote mental health um, to their congregations. And one of the great things to mobilizing prayer groups, prayer helps, it does change things. So mobilizing prayer groups within faith communities, building alliances with other faith communities as well, it can do this, uh, pooling your resources. And because of the COVID-19, people are struggling, who've already had mental health concerns, they are struggling even more now with, um, with anxiety, suicidal thoughts, uh, depression. So if faith communities can come together and pool their resources to help with the communities that are struggling, especially the, uh, the elderly, the disabled, especially in the African-American uh, community, where uh, suicide is uh, on the rise. And so just pulling your resources and how to help these communities as well. So some resources that I have for you on this evening, uh, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a toolkit for community conversations about mental health. And so this toolkit provides information about how to plan a community conversation. And then the other resource is Faith Connections on Mental illness, which uh, advocates, educates, and supports. And meetings are held monthly as guest speakers address mental health issues. And that's Faith Connections on mentalillness.org. And so all of these can provide an, a platform and get conversations started and, and the correct information. I can't say that enough, is that information to, uh, to your community. So that's all I have. Wow, thank you, Yvonne. Way to kick us off here. Your experience and your uh, professional experience as a ordained minister and as a provider, a uh, licensed uh, professional mental health counselor is just 
is so deep. Thank you for those wonderful answers. So destigmatizing, that's very crucial. Well, like you said a couple of times, a faith community getting factual, good information that's solid, that, that reduces stigma, and the referral system for a pastor uh, being that, that it's typically that first person people go to. So, so having those toolkits and premeditating um, different mental health crises that may come your way, having a plan can make all the difference in saving Absolutely. people's lives. Absolutely. And so th thank you for those wonderful resources. I just want to lift up the faith connections on mental illness that you mentioned and SAMHSA, that toolkit uh, on community conversations on mental health is great. The, the th thank you again, Yvonne, for your time and your energy. That, that was wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so next, we'll, we will talk with Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, if you would join us, please. Um, to, you, you're a pastor as well, and you grew up um, in a rural area, and so very grateful for your uh, insight as well. Would you tell us how your faith community um, has responded to mental health concerns. Sure, yeah. Um, first, I just want to echo what Yvonne was saying about a lot of times for folks, their pastor can be the on-ramp to helping them reach out um, to mental health services. I experienced that. I experienced that early on in ministry. Um, I also have a master's of social work, um, and the reason for that was because of that experience. Um, but I want to empower you that even if you do not have um, a social work degree or a counseling degree, um, like Yvonne was saying, to know the resources, to know what is around you, to be able to refer out and do refer out um, when you realize, you know, know your limitations is a good thing. Um, and knowing when people are better equipped um, to, to handle a situation um, I've had people come to me for, for a whole host of things, some of which were not um, in my wheelhouse as a pastor, and being well in, willing to say um, there are people who are better equipped um, to handle this, and I will walk with you, and I will pray with you through this journey, um, but we need more assistance, um, I think is a really important thing. Um, my experience um, as a as a pastor, um, it's just the importance, and I know Yvonne said this too, of just talking about this, talking about it from the pulpit, talking about mental health one-on-one -on -one, um, is so important. A thing that I try to really emphasize is that we should be able to bring our whole authentic selves into worship. Whatever that looks like, whatever emotion that we are feeling, we should be able to bring that before God, um, to not be ashamed of that, um, and just trying to um, create an environment where people do feel like um, they can talk about mental health, and I've seen how positive that can be. And to be honest, I got one of the things that motivated me um, to talk more about um, mental health in worship was, I'll put in a plug real quick for the Partners of Health and Wellness. They have a collaborative pledge um, that encourages you to discuss health regularly throughout the year to preach on that. And it's so important. Um, I've had some of the deepest responses I've had to sermons have been those around mental health issues. Um, and so I, I've talked about depression before and had members, you know, had parishioners come up to me afterwards and say, I never heard anybody talk about depression before in church. Now I feel like I can talk about it. Um, I feel like this has normalized it some. I had, um, I invited someone into the pulpit last year and she wanted to preach about her own experience with depression. It was a powerful sermon. And I recently talked, spoke with someone who said, I just wanted you to know, I realized upon hearing her talk that I too was experiencing depression and I went and got help and it made a big deal. It made a big difference in my life. And so I think it's important to, to talk about these things, to normalize, um, to, when we talk about, and it's important, it's so important because it's important for two reasons for me. One is because we want to meet people where they are. And when we consistently look at studies 
of our local communities, we see that the needs that consistently come up um, are health related. They're concerned about their health. And so we should be concerned about this. The other reason is because I believe um, Jesus gave us an example of holistic ministry and caring about the whole person. I'm always, one of my favorite scriptures is always the story of the hemorrhaging woman in the gospels of where Jesus went to this woman who'd been bleeding for years. Not only did he heal her physically, but he invited her to tell her whole story, to bring her whole self and he offered her a, he a healing that I believe was not only physical, but spiritual and emotional and mental as well. And that's the kind of healing that is desired for us. Um, so I think it's important to encourage um, in that way. But I also have walked with, unfortunately, I have walked with communities through suicide. Um, and I know the devastation that that brings. Um, I unfortunately lost a member of um, my church um, a couple of years ago to suicide. And one of the things that I learned through that experience was not only how deep that loss is for the family, but how deep that loss is for the church and for the greater community. Um, that to this day is still the largest funeral I've ever presided at because of the number of people who showed up who were deeply affected um, we ended up reaching out and doing, um, offering um, pastoral care to the first responders in the community, which you might not initially think about, um, but who had been present um, at the scene with this person and who had been traumatized by this experience. Um, we ended up doing a vigil um, at the local fire department. Um, because that's a communal space for us in a rural community and inviting in um, first responders and the greater community, um, the farmers, this person was a farmer, um, inviting them, them in to participate because they needed to experience healing. The other thing that we need to do as pastors is help um, in the stigma around suicide. It's important. Every single time I have experienced someone dying by suicide, the first question that pops up from all over the community um, is I get phone calls left and right about um, faith and what our faith has to say about suicide. And I always um, point folks to Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Um, and, I, and I think that's important to, to teach that over and over again. People need to hear that um, to kind of help them through um, these difficult times. The other thing I want to say is I love Tiffany's shirt. Can I, Tiffany, I love your shirt. Um, because, and I want you to know I have this sign on my door. I have this sign on my door, and I think we need to say it loud and clearly for everybody. It's okay to have Jesus and a therapist. I say this from the pulpit on a regular basis. <laughs> it's a good word. It's a really good word. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. And thank you all for the ways that you are helping to destigmatize because this is really important. Well, no, thank you, Lindsay, for your, your wisdom and for sharing that. I know it's, it's, it can be hard to talk about these things. And you are, you've said so many wonderful things about bringing our whole self. So faith communities... That is one way that we can help destigmatize mental health concerns and um, prevent suicide is being a place that, that you can bring your whole self. So thank you for naming that. I love that idea of having a guest uh, proclaimer, a guest preacher talk out their mental health experiences and what, what um, their insights are and the fact that that helps someone else identify things within their own journey is that's remarkable so thank you for sharing that and thank you for sharing about um how pastors you know that's a that's a wonderful point that you're making pastors have tremendous influence uh we we listen to sermons throughout our lives and if a pastor can destigmatize from the pulpit and break down that toxic theology uh, and that shame around particularly suicide, that too will save lives. And um, that Romans 8, that, that's a great way to help people in their own grief and just confusion and different things. But, but 
um, you know, there's a lot of things from the pulpit that if a if a congregation and a pastor in particular can shift, it will save lives. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for all that. Um, any closing thoughts or anything, Lindsay? Oh, you're muted. I'm excited to hear from the rest of you. Great, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. It's cool. All right. So Juan, I'd love to hear from you, Juan. Um, you work closely with farm workers and you have a wealth of experience with uh, hospital administration and so forth. So I would love to hear what your thoughts are. How are farm workers in particular impacted by mental health concern? So actually, you know what? Um, I work with H2A workers and, far and non-migrant families normally. And I'll be honest to you, we, you have to go back to the culture of the Latino culture uh, there is not such a thing as a mental health issues. Normally, it's very, it's a taboo. It's still up to this day. You know, the way that you see these guys, you know, every time they move over here to the United States and in a temporary visa or guest visas, they come with issues. They left problems back home. So in the moment that they come over here, they start having a lot of issues. They, 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 sometimes they, can, they come because of financial pressure, you know. Sometimes they have to... According to the law, they're not supposed to buy those visas, H-2A, but in Mexico that happened. So they had to sell or they had to propose a children or it's a sex trafficking. It's a lot of stuff going on with them. So they come here to, to work a lot, to do a lot of stuff. They have a lot going on over here when they move over here. So the way that they cope with all this is alcohol. Alcohol, they start self-medication, they start self-medication themselves. And when something happened back home and they have all these stressors in their life they so far this year we already have three incidents two three farm workers killed themselves during the season because their family his their girlfriend left and there were some issues that they i cannot disclose because of hipaa but the thing is that they they lost their life because of that so and they were under influence on alcohol and in other cases, we have a lot of farm workers coming with undiagnosed uh, mental health illness. You know, we had two cases of schizophrenia. They thought they would be having some issues, but happening that he blow us with the stress and everything else. So they have, you know, pretty much Latino culture is very close to to be a Catholic. So that's the only way that our culture is called uh, is evangelistic or Catholic. So any of the churches that they are common, I've been trying to reach the priests and everything to go and, and there. I'm per, I myself, I'm a Catholic person, from a Catholic. So, and, um, and they, apparently the church is not interested to reach up to them. Sometimes that peace of mind to listen to that they are not alone here, struggling with everything, is gonna be a good, a, good, a good thing for them, you know? At least they help them to feel more at ease all the problems that they are behind, you know? And plus now with the COVID-19 is another stressor that you can add to them, you know, because they are struggling. And when it's raining, they don't make enough money. They don't do everything. And there is a big stigma because uh, that's another issue because I work with, with some uh, mental health workers, you know, so we go to the farm, we educate them about to identify stress or to identify issues going on with them. But they consider that, that, oh, no, that don't happen to me. Don't worry about that and everything else and there. But they still hear the problem is still there. You know, they left their problems back there in, in like a, you are far away and remote, remote from the families. And they don't know. And they consider that that is a stigma being having some depressions, having some issues. They prefer to alcohol or doing something else. And I start doing there. And when they cannot control that, they go and do a lot of damage and they do more control. So we're trying to talk to the group when this happened because the whole group is been is get a little bit um, affected, you know. Now we have also we work also with non-migrant families, what we call migrant families that they are families they coming from Florida up to Pennsylvania with the harvest and um, they come to and there is another one. This is more stressful. There is, so there, there is um domestic violence is in there, you know, so, and there is abuse internally. And remember right now, the COVID-19, they were locked with a perpetrator during all this time. So it's still locked with a perpetrator all this time. And there is no way that they can communicate that, alcohol issues and everything again. And sometimes I feel that for 
I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about my church, you know, my Catholic church. They, it's not interesting to reach up to them because they have, they need to do more to reach them. But um, uh, normally it's, it's very common that there is not, it's a cultural base actually, it's a stigma because it's the moment that we, as a Latinos, we don't want to consider we have an issue, you know, everybody has issue, everybody has a stress in their life, everybody has everything going on, and you can find your guidance through God or, tr or trying to find a system with somebody. It's okay to say that you have a problem, but that doesn't happen in the Latino community. You know, it's very hard to break into that. You can bring tons of resources. I know that El Centro is doing a good job trying to give telehealth, but they don't want to feel being tagged alone in the farm saying, oh, this is the local guy, you know, the guy who has mental issues, you know, he doesn't want, they don't want to go through that. And so it's a very challenge, these barriers. So you're trying to educate them, trying to identify stressors in their life. Uh, what are the symptoms of depression? So we we have a, we do education on camps, you know, tell them, hey, this is the stress of error. Doesn't mean that you feel like that, you're gonna be start drinking and having this, having that and whatever, you know, and then come to the solution is not in there. And, and it's okay, it's okay to say that you have an issue, you need to address those issues. It's good for you because in the moment that you disclose all that, all that boiling pan that you have inside of you, you're gonna feel better. So, and it's been challenged, you know, we already have like a three incidents these years, pretty much all the years we have three or four that they come here and they just um, um, happens, sadly. And then um, also we have undiagnosed uh, mental illness that it was a schizophrenia one case and bipolar to the extreme, manic moods. So they went into the ex total extreme, you know, and trying to kill her co-workers so um but again so we're trying to educate them educate that doesn't mean you need to have doesn't mean that you have to take that uh, pill that is gonna tag you or make a taboo into you so it's pretty much it's a very it's a big problem because it's cultural in latin america we are behind 20 years at least in mental health you know at least 20 years so and when you offer those services, they don't want to receive them. They don't care about those things. But I think so that the word of God is going to be, it's a good way to approach them, you know? So, but still, I didn't find support with the, my Catholic church in the area, you know? But pretty much, I know gonna be, everybody's going to be Catholic, you know? So, um, and, and besides that, it's a lot of barriers that you have to do. And plus, you have to add this year COVID-19, you know? So, because maybe family back there in Mexico has the problem with COVID-19 or they get contaminated over here with COVID-19 and you know, and the taboo, the whole thing, trying to find out, are you gonna die? Are you gonna be able to make? And especially money-wise. If you don't work those 15 days, you don't get the money and bring a lot of stress to them, you know? So it's, it's a big, there is a lot of work to do yet for the farm workers community. But it's not, it's not failed to nobody else, it's just cultural, but we need to grow a little bit. We have to improve by national programs, you know, because if they have services here, they can need to be followed over there in Mexico too, or wherever they come from, you know? So, and it's, it's good to have that and I have a good base, you know, so people go communicate between all the agencies and trying to do that. And as you do, uh, we're trying to do a little bit we we only serve approximately 900 guys off of the 16,000 who comes over here. But it's a little bit what we are trying to do. We're trying to improve a little bit more in the future, you know? Doesn't mean that it's gonna be stopped there. So there is more work to do and more things that we need to put in place for them and help them, you know? And also this affects also the farm workers also affect the growers family, you know, the farmers too, because they, it's a, it's a cascade sy syndrome, you know, if they have issues, even goes vice versa also, the, the grower or the farmer start having issues and then go transfer to the farm workers and vice versa. It's a lot of things going on, but nobody wants to recognize that. They think that Dr. Alcohol is the solution and that is not the solution, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the biggest issues. The self-medication is the worst thing that you ever can do. And that, we bump into that a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Th thank you, Juan. That, that is so illuminating. I think for folks um, such as myself, you know, we can gather ideas, but hearing that 
that empirical experience and uh, I'm so sorry to hear that people um, have died by suicide and, and that the substance abuse and the, the cycle that I'm hearing from just the, the stigma and the cultural issues that are anchored so deeply in these people into their beings. And so it's quite a challenge. So, it's, so I applaud you and thank you for doing the educational piece. I think that probably does more than you ever will realize. I hope, I hope you know that um, sure. by saying everybody has problems and different things going on and it's okay to speak up. So thank you for doing that. That, that rural communities, um, as we work together and, and no matter if it's faith or secular, that, that's huge, that educational piece. So thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, that, that helps just paint a good picture of just COVID, the financial parts, the cultural barriers. There's a lot there. And so it's, it's easy to forget a lot of those things when you know, in the shame and the judgment that our society puts on mental health concerns and suicide. So, so thank you for reminding us uh, and, and talking about those challenges so openly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, anytime. Thank you, Juan. Uh, that's, that's really helpful to hear that as we think of how we can support uh, Juan and farm workers. Um, next, I want to talk with Lamar. Lamar has also experience of that day-to-day -day operation of a farm and the stress that can go with that and just the life and the culture of that. And, and he works closely with the, Ag the Institute for Agromedicine and farmers and foresters and fishermen and all kinds of people in, in these positions. So Lamar, thanks for joining us tonight. I, I would like to ask you to start, what are the ways that the day-to-day -day business and work of a farm impact mental health? Help us understand. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, I, and if I start to uh, fade out or something, just uh, wave your hands or throw something at me. <clears throat> so, we do safety and health programs for farmers, foresters, fishermen, their family members and their workers all across the state. So we cover the gamut of those three primary occupations and the people that they work with. Uh, we have uh, a lot of resources that have been made available to us through grants and through other programs. We work directly with Farm Bureau. We work with the county extension uh, organizations. Uh, and their directors in every single county. Uh, we do uh, programs with the farm credit associations and we put together a pretty good uh, group of folks uh, who go out and do uh, educational programs for the farmers to help uh, raise awareness. Uh, you know, just like uh, Yvonne was talking about early on, raising awareness of what the issues are. And we have to remember that the farmers and the Latinos coming in, as Juan pointed out, these are hands-on people. These are, are folks who don't want to think about sitting down in front of a computer and doing uh, busy work and, and business work. And they would much rather be out working all the time. Well, the weather holds them back. That's a frustration for them. And that builds some of that frustration level. It impacts uh, the crops that they're uh, planting and the crops that they have to harvest. Uh, this year, the COVID-19 uh, was a huge concern because a lot of workers couldn't get into the area in time because of COVID-19 spreading uh, concerns. Uh, and so all of those things have, have raised the issue. Also keep in mind that most farmers uh, throughout the United States, not just here in North Carolina, have to borrow large amounts of money for operating costs each year. They're hoping to be able to pay that back and at the end of the year with their good crops and good prices, but those things also add to the stress of agriculture. I farmed until I was 35 in Eastern Iowa and I, um, 1986, uh, when I was 35, uh, washed me out of farming because we were paying 20% interest on loans. 
that's a far cry from what we're paying now. But even so, the margins have been cut thinner and thinner as we've gone along, which makes it more and more difficult to make money uh, with the operating loans and so forth. And so I was the sixth generation. It impacted me tremendously and it's impacting other farmers too. I, I, I watch on Twitter, I watch on Facebook, I, I look at the posts of people who are following me and who I follow to see if there's a change in their routine, a change in the, in the darkness of the posts that they put out. And I reach out to them and say, uh, everything going okay? Just uh, saw your post and uh, wondered if there was anything you might need right now. And I've had several people contact me back and say, well, as a matter of fact, yes, I do need somebody to talk with. And, and so we get together one way or another, whether it's through uh, that medium or a phone call or email or some other method. But we look for those changes in people so that we can understand that something's going on that's a little bit different. Years ago, I did a program. Uh, I grew up in Iowa, so it was at the University of Iowa, and, and the program was designed with that whole thing in mind that uh, we would look for changes. So maybe the farmer who always met the mailman out at the uh, mailbox every day, and he hasn't been out there very much anymore, and so the postman uh, can uh, get in touch with somebody to give that farmer a call, one of the farmer's friends, small community, they all know each other anyway. We talk about, to the veterinarians and we say, uh, you know, what kind of, of animal health is going on at that farm? Are there changes there? Well, you know, he hasn't been vaccinating quite like he used to with his uh, uh, cattle or or whatever it might be. And, and so because of that, that change in behavior is a little bit different. Maybe he's kept his uh, barnyard spruced up to the max throughout the years, and now it's kind of grown up to grass and weeds, or the paint's pretty faded, and normally he would have put a new coat of paint on, but he hasn't been doing that. And those are the changes that that parishioners can look at and can see that's going on in the neighborhood that they drive through every day and can look at that and then reach out to them, make a cold call, if you will, which is really difficult for a lot of us to do, but it's so very important. And, and people will view that, you know, with all of the stresses that they've had, but now somebody took the time to reach out to me and, and noticed that there was something different going on in my life. And they don't want to share necessarily. They want to be stoic. They want to be uh, the unbothered he-man who is self-made and, and builds things up and never needs any help of their own. And they, don't necessarily want to reach out, but if someone reaches out to them, quite often they do open up and talk about some of those things that are starting to bother them a little bit. And all you have to do at that point is to sit back and listen and ask the open-ended questions of, I, it sounds like you're really troubled by the amount of money that you've got borrowed. I, do you think that you'll make that back at, at harvest time this year? And, you know, open those up so that at least they can talk that out and let some of that stress go. Uh, many years ago, my mother uh, was boiling potatoes in a pressure cooker, and she was absolutely convinced that it was completely done, and she had me trying to get the lid off. I didn't know anything about pressure cookers. And so I... I pushed and I pulled and I tugged on that lid and I got it off and it exploded uh, boiled potatoes all up the side of the cupboard. And she said, well, I guess that's done. Neither one of us was injured, but you know, that pressure builds up inside. And if there isn't something venting it appropriately, it can explode and be a bigger issue than we had in mind. And, and so we just have to be aware of what's going on around us. We have to, uh, whether it's a farming family or someone else, 
look for the changes in that family. Maybe they've been going to church every Sunday faithfully for years and years, and now if they come once a month, it's, a, it's quite a surprise. And, and so we reach out to them and, and say, hey, just thought I'd check in and see how you're doing. And if you keep it light and, and uh, uh, wait for them to respond, quite often they will. Uh, we do have a program uh, called Farmer to Farmer. I put in the chat box uh, our website, uh, ncagromedicine.org. The Farmer to Farmer program is a peer counseling program that we've got. If uh, folks don't have money for counseling sessions, we have up to three sessions uh, free for them uh, that they can come to us and uh, can uh, communicate with us and talk with us about it. And our contact information is on that web page as well. So, uh, and a lot of other resources too. So, thank you, Lamar. That is that is so important. What you're saying is something we can all practice. That intentionality just being aware of what's going on outside of our own selves and families, uh, being observant. And as you mentioned, even driving down the road in a rural community, just noticing things that are different about a person's property even. And then getting outside of our comfort zone to just check in, you know, a simple check in can lead to uh, a life-saving conversation. And as you put it, uh, someone just needing to, to get the stress out and just vent, you know, that can change somebody's whole week, uh, a quick conversation. And so that connection that you're talking about, that's so crucial. So thank you for raising that. And it helps us um, as the listeners just to have a better idea of all these things that people are holding, um, you know, in a normal time, and then you have COVID and whatnot, and, and everything piled on. So it's a difficult time. Uh, thank you, Lamar. That's great. And so, so faith communities with, as you mentioned, being a place, uh, checking in, noticing differences, and practicing that intentionality, and also that farmer to farmer program. I just want to lift that up again. And, um, and with the whole theme of tonight, faith communities and rural communities, asking questions, being a place where you can listen um, thoughtfully and carefully can can do um, remarkable wonders. So thank you, Lamar, for your work. You bet. So, so next, I'm very happy to um, bring our next speaker, Tiffany, who is a licensed uh, social worker, and she has a number of committees that she does boots on the ground suicide prevention work and task force. She serves on the Mental Health Association uh, for Forsyth County, and she's on uh, a couple of suicide prevention task force and so thank you tiffany for joining us tonight so grateful for your your uh, expertise and your energy and so to, to keep the conversation going can you tell us what are effective ways that we can check on someone that we're concerned about that that establishes trust and reduces shame so thank you yeah i'm glad to be here and i've for a minute there, I forgot I was on the panel listening to everyone and hearing all the great information that was shared. Um, as Lamar said, you know, being intentional, recognizing when um, things have changed with people, putting information out there. Yvonne and Lindsay hit, hit the nail on the head about speaking from the pulpit um, about mental health and inviting people out so that we can normalize the conversation around mental health. The reality is we all have a brain, which means we all have mental health. Um, whether we're going to be mentally ill or not, you know, we, we all have mental health and we need to learn how to be mentally well. Um, so talking openly about mental health can help eliminate that shame, reduce that stigma not using mental health as an adjective. You know, you hear people saying things like, oh, the weather's so bipolar um, and things of that nature. Let's stop that um, and let's call it for what it is. Um, changing how we talk, watching our language can help us 
reduce the stigma and eliminate shame. And it can also give those who are struggling with their mental health room to speak and opportunity to tell their story or to find some help if they need it. Um, the community learning what mental health is, what, what mental illness is, learning about the signs, um, how to recognize those, um, participating in trainings, I mean, presentations like this, finding trainings in the community. Uh, you can go to the North Carolina chapter AFSP website to find um, different programs that you could bring to your community or trainings that's out there learning about your mental health associations in your area so that you can participate um, in those trainings, learn about support groups. They're great resources for individuals to find out who are the local mental health providers in their area. Doing all of this helps make the conversation easier. It helps open those doors. It, it lets people know that it's okay to talk about their mental health um, and what's, what's happening with them. It's okay if you don't have the words. I, I tell everyone to put the crisis line number in their phone. Just be there, listen to folks and be honest. Tell them, you know, I don't know what to say. I don't know how you're feeling, but I will sit with you while we call the crisis line. I will sit with you in the waiting area. I will take you to the urgent care. Whatever the case may be um, to get that person help. We get nervous as folks because we, we don't know the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't want to make things worse. So we tend to shy away from it. As Lamar said, recognizing the pharma who hasn't been to the vet in a while or who hasn't come out to greet the the mailman, we see it, but we don't know what to do about it. And sometimes all you need to do is be there, be there, be open, be willing to listen. I, I operate from the standpoint that no one else sees it but me. I'm the only one that saw it. I'm the only one that heard it. So that means I'm the one that needs to either give the crisis line number, ask them if they're okay, ask them if they need anything, just opening that door, don't assume that someone else will take care of it. So having programs like this, bringing programs to your church, um, bringing them to your community center so that people can get involved um, and engaged in opening up that conversation and knowing the resources in your community. Um, North Carolina DHHS has a website where you can find mobile crisis service for your county. Find out who, who you need to call. They also talk about CIT officers. I say CIT, people have no idea what I'm talking about. That's a crisis intervention trained officer that has went through the training um, to learn about mental health and how to respond. Uh, so educating yourself on where to go within your community um, and who, who can help. Uh, Winston-Salem, where I live and work, isn't a rural area, but the folks that live in Stokes County and Surrey County and Yakin County and Davie County, sometimes the people that live in Wilkes County come to Winston for their medical and mental health services. Uh, that's a far drive. So for the people that are in Wilkes County and Stokes County, having their churches and community centers bring people out to them so that they can talk and, and learn how to be safe, learn how to be mentally well, uh, learn the signs, the warning signs. Um, that's how we begin to help each other. I have no idea if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> you did, Tiffany. You certainly did. Gosh, that's awesome. Thank you for that. And, you, and the second question is, how can we reduce stigma related to suicide in our conversations? And you did, you did touch on that with uh, reducing, not using um, mental health concerns as adjectives and as a descriptor. Is there anything else you would like to say on that? You know, we need to look at mental health um, we need to just look at it as health. 
we need mm-hmm. to stop separating physical health and mental health. It's, mm-hmm. it's whole health, our whole body health. Mm-hmm. We know that um, if we're not feeling mentally well, that can um, cause physical symptoms. We know if our physical health is off, it can cause mental health symptoms. So we need to look at it as whole health and treating the whole person. And when we can do that, when we can sit and talk openly about major depressive disorder, the same way we can sit and talk about cancer, Uh, The same way we can sit and talk about HIV, we can sit and talk about suicide prevention and how do we remain healthy. Once we can put those two together and bridge that gap and continue that conversation in that manner, that's going to do so much in helping reduce the stigma um, surrounding mental health and suicide prevention. That's great. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, you answered it wonderfully. You such a great tip to have that hotline number in our phones. Just have it with us. Yeah. It's simply sitting with someone, not having the answers, not having the the words all the time, but the presence. And so what you're saying is is so true and such a great reminder. Thank you. And and having those trainings, whether it's mental health first aid or um, you mentioned knowing about local resources. That takes time and energy for us to sit down and look locally, but it will pay dividends. And you brought up the the NC, the HHS, the mobile service, um, crisis services, the mobile, you put the link in the chat. Thank you, that is crucial to know about that. Um, They will come to you and train for those crisis scenarios. Uh, yeah, talking openly about about stigma and treating people's whole people. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, so, so be thinking, uh, listeners, for any questions you may have. Uh, we're nearing the end of our time. Uh, we can take a couple of questions if you want to write them in the chat. Uh, but just a, a quick overview of some of the resources in the meantime that have been mentioned tonight. First of all, the mentalhealth.gov, the SAMHSA, that's S-A-M-S-A toolkit and community conversations on mental health. If you Google that, you'll be able to find that. Uh, Faith Connections on Mental Illness, which is a group. um, That's a wonderful group. Uh, Mental Health First Aid was mentioned. The different county extensions for different counties have health and mental health resources and the farmer to farmer um, counseling program that was mentioned. Uh, Let's see, and different ones were in the chat as well. And I want to lift up Partners in Health and Wholeness, which is the organization uh, that was mentioned by Lindsay. We have many grants. If your faith community is working on mental health or suicide prevention, we have many grants to help fund your project. So maybe you want to host mental health first aid, for instance. So, so wonderful, wonderful resources, and there's more, but we'll send a follow-up email and include those. And of course, again, want to definitely highlight the North Carolina chapter for American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and North Carolina Agro Medicine Institute, Rafi and come to the table in North Carolina Council of Churches and the Farm Stress Resource Directory. uh, Robin put that in the chat. Thank you, Robin. Uh, So so wonderful. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat. I don't see anything yet unless I've missed one. Um, But but Um, go ahead. Jessica, I just wanted to say to, um, I just want to reiterate the importance of taking care of yourself yes we're we're talking about a lot here about how we can help our community but we can't help our community if we don't look after ourselves Um, i know as a united methodist we have funds through our conference to help pay for mental health a lot of churches offer that check with your bigger conference or who your diocese whoever you belong to and check for that that's often available Um, I am very open with my congregation that I go to counseling often. Um, It it is a godsend, and it's a godsend right now. And even um, if you've had coping mechanisms in the past, 
we need new ones because we've never experienced a pandemic before. So I've had to come up with new coping mechanisms. Um, I have made counseling a priority. I really, really want to recommend that to you. Um, and if you're having a hard time, it's okay because right. this is a hard season. So be kind to yourself, please yeah. be kind to yourself. And, and practically speaking, um, two things that we're doing, we're, we're noticing. So a lot of these issues were already present before mm -hmm. COVID COVID just exasperates it. Right. Um, but we're experiencing isolation mm -hmm. in a way that we have never experienced before. And so two practical recommendations I would make to you. One is if you can get your elderly and your people who are isolated online, um, and I say this because I just taught two 90 year olds this week, y'all how to use, um, zoom bless, right? Um, they're both in their nineties and they learned how to use zoom and we had to do a tutorial and it was a whole thing, but we did it and you should see their faces. Um, at just being able to connect in some way. We've thrown Zoom parties just to have older members of our congregation be able to see each other. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is in a rural setting, but, but just to have that kind of interaction. We, people who have dementia, it is so much worse right now, y'all, because they're not interacting on a regular basis in the way that they normally are. Their caregivers are strained. Caregivers are strained in a way they never have been before. And so we have folks who get on with us at, for Bible study or worship just to be able to see faces. That's right. And what this does for our folks, even our folks experiencing dementia, just to be able to see another person is so good. And the other thing I would say is... Um, if you can encourage your churches to adopt a neighbor, ah, just yeah. pick a person. My family's done this and it's been a blessing to us. We have two neighbors who are um, in their nineties and isolated and we cut, we bring food. They miss home cooked meals. Their families don't live anywhere near them. So they're not, and that's been exasperated. They can't travel okay. to come see them right now. And so we may just go knock on their door. We're practicing social distancing. We stay on the other side of the glass. We mask up. But to see their faces, to have my kids stand on the other side of the door and sing songs to them, or just to have made them a card or bring them flowers, it's a simple act. We just find something simple. We may just stop for five minutes on the way home from school. And it makes a huge difference. So if you can encourage people just to, to make buddies to check in on people during this time is so crucial. Thank you, Lindsay, that, that is so huge. And thank you for just emphasizing, yes, I couldn't agree more. We have to take care of ourselves and, and, and the way that we check in with others, we need to check in with our own self and notice things about us that feel not in the usual routine or, or maybe we're um, just living a different pace, we're feeling off or, do, different things are bothering us more than they would other times. And that is perfectly reasonable and understandable during this difficult time. And, and therefore just listening in and tuning in to ourselves and, and, um, and, and reducing stigma in our own ways that we view our own mental health. It's just as crucial so that we can practice compassion and empathy with others. We have to practice it with ourselves. And so, Thank you, Lindsay, for this crucial. That's great. I love adopt a neighbor and, and then the, the isolation. That is, that is very crucial if this works. So thank you. It's a huge thank you for circling us back. Well, thank you to Yvonne, Lindsay, Juan, Lamar, and Tiffany. Thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, your energy, your presence. Uh, the, the things that we talked about tonight are, um, this is a conversation that we will keep having in our communities and in our, in our conversations with our families and friends. And thank you for giving us things to talk about from tonight that will be productive and um, take away stigma, reduce stigma, and, and save lives. This is important work that we're doing together. So I happily hand it over to Jared. Thank you to Jared for being our tech guru tonight. And um, thank you all so much. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone for participating in this conversation with us.
Um, we definitely hope that you've been able to take away some tools for exploring how we can collectively address issues of mental health um, within our congregations and all of our communities. Um, so a special thanks to Jessica for leading us this evening and to each of our panelists for sharing uh, your wisdom, your experience, your perspectives. Um, as mentioned previously, we will be sending out a follow-up email with all of the resources for you and your communities. Um, additionally, if you are able, please fill out the survey that's been linked in the chat and it will also be included in the follow-up email. Um, we definitely wanna hear from you uh, to hear um, what you learned, what went well, what didn't, what didn't go well, um, and how we can better shape events like these. Um, so thank you to everyone, and I hope you all have a great evening. The same. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a good night. Take care, everybody. Thank you again.